Hey, works better than twice as well. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube, and those videos are available to watch on those platforms anytime afterward. And if you've not already silenced your cell phone, please do so now. If you're looking for a fun road trip, Friday, March 24th from 3.30 to 5.30 at the Grand Village of the Natchez, members of the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians will demonstrate traditional dances in the game of stickball. Those are free, but you're encouraged to bring a lawn chair or a blanket. And then on the evening of Tuesday, March 28th, we'll partner with the Golden Waldenberg Institute of Southern Jewish Life for the Mississippi Freedom Seder. The participatory program will feature rituals, readings, songs, and food. Tickets are available on the MDAH website. Finally, I hope you'll come back next Wednesday for History's Lunch when Jackson native Susan Anna Curry will discuss her memoir, The Preventorium, which was recently published by the University Press of Mississippi. Today, I am delighted to welcome back our friend Philip Gordon to discuss Hubert Creekmore's lost novel, The Welcome. Memphis native Pip Gordon is an associate professor of English and the LGBTQ plus studies coordinator at the University of Wisconsin Platteville, as well as advisor to the campus newspaper, The Exponent. Gordon earned his BA in English from the University of Tennessee Martin and his MA and PhD in English, both from the University of Mississippi. His book, Gay Faulkner, Uncovering a Homosexual Presence in Yakna Patalfa and Beyond, was published by the University Press of Mississippi in 2020. He gave a great history as lunch on it then. We're delighted to have him back. Help me welcome Pip Gordon. They said it, oh, no, I guess it's on real fast. That was, that was quick, okay. Um, it's, I know I'm back in Mississippi from Wisconsin when, I, when someone can introduce me and mention the name Yakavatafa and get it right. That, that doesn't happen as much up north. Um, okay, let's see. So, let me get started today. Excellent. Uh, it is a delight to be here today, or actually, I guess, uh, to say to be back here today. Uh, and I want to start with thanks to several people who have been involved uh, with the reissue of Hubert Creekmore's novel, The Welcome. Um, I get the joy of standing up here and speaking about it, but it has definitely involved many, many more people than just me. Uh, so, obviously, first off, to Chris Goodwin and his team here uh, at the Mississippi Museums, um, it is a joy to be down here uh, again. Um, I have several friends who have also stood on this stage for their own presentations, including a few weeks ago, two of my very good friends for their book, The Tacky South, uh, and all of them will attest that this weekly series is really kind of a, one of the most wonderful gigs that you can get as an academic. It's just so like delightfully celebratory and engaging. So many academic gigs, you're like, what, I can't miss me. Here you just get to talk about your project. It's just cool. Um, and like I said, I'm thrilled to be here, though technically for my second time, but more on that in a moment. Second to the University Press of Mississippi, especially uh, Katie Keene, also the publicist for the book, Courtney McCreary, Steve Yates, who's joining us today, um, and uh, many others at the press for their efforts to bring the welcome back. I'll add a quick thank you to my, my, one of my best friends in life, uh, Natalie Ritter, who I have known since the last century and I will leave it at that. Uh, we met in middle school and have just been very good friends. She drove up from Baton Rouge today uh, to hear this talk. Uh, and finally, and probably most importantly, to be honest, I'd like to thank the Creekmore and Welty families, uh, Mary Alice, Jimmy, Wade, Meredith, Donnie, and so many others from the family. It, has, it is an honor to be able to share Hubert's work and humbling uh, that I'm the one who is uh, allowed to speak to his legacy. I do feel somewhat out of place here today, though. Um, I, I, I previously did have the pleasure of presenting on the stage for my book, uh, Gay Faulkner, back in the summer of 2020, though under somewhat different circumstances. Uh, originally, I was booked to speak here to a full live audience in March, almost exactly three years ago today. Um, and on a trip south during my spring break, that was also going to be a book tour, I think you can all remember 
that didn't work out, uh, really for any of us, for a little while there. Um, <laughs> but I do appreciate that Chris uh, guided history as lunch through that shutdown, and I was able to speak here on a sultry, hot July day, um, which, by the way, as I was reminding Chris, was also the day the old state flag was delivered here uh, to, the, to the museums. Um, interesting that I got to be down here for that. Um, that day I had Chris and a handful of museum staff here in the room to give a bit of a human touch, to, to nod knowingly and to laugh if I tried to tell the joke. But otherwise I was speaking to a faceless online crowd and a decent crowd and I appreciated that. But it is definitely nice to be here in person today with, with people. And, and for those of you who are online, I don't want you to feel bad. Thanks for being here too. Um, but really I feel awkward. <laughs> Because in a very real way, I'm a bit of an imposter this time around, I am not the author of the book in question today. Hubert Creekmore published The Welcome in 1948, the second of three novels that he would publish. There are two additional unpublished manuscripts that are housed in his papers at the Howard Gottlieb Center at Boston University. The Welcome, to the best of my knowledge, only have had uh, one printing in hardcover. Uh, it did receive a short and mostly unkind review in late October in 1948 in the New York Times. Creekmore would write home to his sister about the review, which rightfully displeased him. Notably, the review of the welcome appeared towards the end of the same weekly book review insert that included a much longer and much more robust and praising review of one William Faulkner for his novel, Intruder in the Dust, Rather famously, the hyper-prolific Faulkner had one prolonged period in his writing life where his productivity waned in what most scholars chalk up to sort of extended writer's block. After publishing almost one novel a year from 1928 to 1942, he went quiet for six years. Intruder marked his return to the literary world, and he was invited to New York and feted by his publishers, at least famously until he disappeared on one of his benders. In fact, he got so drunk that his friend, the actress Ruth Ford, had to intervene and send him out to Connecticut to dry out at the home of Malcolm and Muriel Cowley. A couple years prior, that same Malcolm Cowley had published The Portable Faulkner, which, twinned with the arrival of Intruder, arguably marks the turning point in Faulkner's career from weird Southern author uh, to his ascent to winning the Nobel Prize in Literature. In the process, though, he swallowed up an awful lot of oxygen in the proverbial room of the literary marketplace. At least metaphorically, Creekmore's relegation to a short review towards the end of the review insert marks the beginning of a process of marginalization of other Mississippi writers in the wake of Faulkner's massive gravity, the lesser known moons to Faulkner's oversized Jupiter, we might say, when their books didn't sell particularly well they slowly started disappearing. Now, nearly three quarters of a century later, I who stand before you am only the author of the introduction to Creekmore's book. Creekmore died in 1966 of a heart attack in a taxi in New York City on his way to the airport for a long planned trip to Spain. He never enjoyed the literary fame of his peers like William Faulkner or Eudora Welty. He has been mostly forgotten, and the welcome has mostly appeared as a title listed in anthologies of so-called lost gay novels when it is mentioned at all. But I don't know. Given our recent cinematic love affair with this idea called the multiverse, maybe we can imagine that in some other timeline, not our own, Creekmore's novel was picked up by the right reviewer or the right publicist it did ascend the steps of relative fame and recognition. And some time before his death, maybe, just maybe, someone in that alternate universe said, you know, Hubert, all things being equal, you wrote one hell of a good book. In our timeline, we cannot afford him that courtesy in person. But with this reissue, I hope that more people can have the opportunity to appreciate the legacy of this writer who is not lesser nor insubstantial. I'd like to think that maybe he was just a little too far ahead of his time. So, after such a long preamble, I suppose I should find a proper place to start this talk today. 
I'd like to tell you a little bit about the welcome, but I also want to talk to you about how we arrived here to its being reissued, which involved many people over many years, all of whom deserve more recognition than I can give them today. But, you know, I also, of course, want to talk about Creekmore, no doubt. <laughs> but let's frame this as something maybe like a bit of a literary thriller, because I think maybe I'm in a room full of some book lovers who will appreciate that being my approach. And for that approach, I need to start with my own, let's say, Creekmore beginnings. So there I was, standing in the J.D. Williams Library on the campus of the University of Mississippi, holding in my hand an old hardcover book of a old hardcover copy of a little known book by an otherwise forgotten writer. It was 2007 or so, and I was taking an independent study with Dr. Jamie Harker on queer Southern literature. She had assigned me to read the novel The Welcome by Hubert Creekmore and told me I could find a copy in the library on campus. The novel was otherwise very, very difficult to find. At the time, the one online copy I did find on the website allibras.com cost a cool $500, which was somewhat outside of my budget as a graduate student, saying. The card catalog for our library said that we had two copies available in circulation, an additional copy in special collections. And thus, there I was, holding one of those two copies for general checkout in my hand. For the record, I did return that copy at the end of the semester, but later, when Creekmore came back into my life in 2010, I went to check it out again and found that one of those two copies in circulation had gone missing. Fearful that the second copy might also disappear, I broke the law, maybe-ish. I checked out that one copy. I took it to my office in Somerville Hall, where the graduate student offices were, uh, and one night, well after 10 p.m., um, I made copies of it, <laughs> uh, just in case, just in case. I had it bound at a print shop on West Jackson Avenue where I also had my dissertation prepared. I did return that library copy as soon I was done with my own copying efforts because on some level, I was genuinely just terrified that the book really was going to just up and disappear, victim of the great nothing, as they say in that movie, The NeverEnding Story, that glorious 1980s film where when no one reads a book, it leads to that book vanishing forever, forgotten for all time. <sighs> Jamie Harker once told me that college English professors have two primary jobs. First, to find and preserve lost and forgotten text. Second, to tell high school English teachers what they should be teaching. When I arrived in graduate school, I was utterly convinced that if I could read enough esoteric literary theory and master the rhetorical gamesmanship of some ivory tower scholars, I could make any argument I wanted and win any intellectual battles. I wanted to make a compelling argument about the history of LGBTQ plus identities in Southern literature. I spent a lot of time and a lot of words trying to frame my theories from an, let's say, abstract frame of mind. With enormous patience, Jamie slowly but surely worked to show me that books are not only abstract ideas. They are real, physical things involved with the history of print culture and consumption, our understanding of them is shaped by forces of the literary marketplace, not just by some Lacanian psychoanalysis or Foucauldian historiographies. And so there I was, holding a book in my hands by Hubert Creekmore, titled The Welcome. It was set in a fictional town called Ashton, modeled off of Water Valley, the town in which Jamie lived and where she now runs a little bookstore called Violet Valley Books, which you should all go up and see some Saturday. Also, it was Creekmore's hometown, a stomping ground for his youth before he attended the University of Mississippi in the mid-1920s, following in the footsteps of his older brothers, Rufus and Wade Sr. Beyond the local connections, though, the more deeply compelling interest in this book, at least for me, 
was that I was assigned to read it for an independent study on queer Southern literature, which is to say that Hubert Creekmore had written a local queer novel that could, in theory, be indicative of queer history in rural North Mississippi, no less. Some other context here matters for the recent efforts by the state legislature to curtail LGBTQ plus rights certainly reminds us that in Mississippi, the past really is never dead, apparently, and queer existence is always under threat. We didn't really need those reminders in the 2000 aughts. It was a rough time to be gay in Mississippi, and narratives of queer life tended towards the starkly terrifying. Take, for example, Kevin Smith's 2006 documentary, Small Town Gay Bar, about gay bars in rural Mississippi, such as one called Rumors up in Shannon, just south of Tupelo. The documentary is structured as a view into the borderline tragic, marginalized queer lives of North Mississippi, always one breath away from possible violence, always clinging to safe spaces that are always under economic, political, and moral threat. In 2007 and 2008, same-sex marriage was not terribly likely in Mississippi. Pride events were very rare, though not unheard of. There's been other historians who have done some work of uncovering efforts for pride events in various cities around the state. But it was very easy to feel that we were clinging to the edges, and it would have been very nice to find evidence that we had a place here, and maybe always have, on a scholarly level, John Howard's landmark study, Men Like That, A Southern Queer History, first published in 1999, had laid the groundwork for seeing through the apparent lack of visible queer culture into the rural spaces of the state, where mobility, where literally using cars to visit lovers and create community, define the shape of gay life. Howard's history goes back to the 1940s, and he does make reference to The Welcome and to Creekmore in his book. Notably, in the novel The Welcome, our two would-be lovers, Don Mason and Jim Furlow, find solace in the mobility afforded by cars. As teenagers, a critical moment in their nascent relationship occurs when they drive out together to an abandoned church in the countryside and discuss its ruins as a metaphor for old institutions no longer viable in the new, emerging, modernized world. What they mean is that the trajectories of their lives, graduate high school, attend university, find wives, marry, have children, don't quite fit their senses of what they want to be and what possibilities could offer them different outcomes. But as happens so often in the novel, they come so close to saying, but then do not say what could come next. A better future could come if they would admit, if they could admit that they love each other. It is always on the tips of their tongues, but it stays unsaid between them. One famous historical euphemism for homosexuality vis-a-vis -vis Oscar Wilde is, it is the love that dare not speak its name. Jim and Don find themselves unable to say what they feel for each other, though John Howard's work does help us in retrospect say aloud what in its historical context remains unspoken. But back to the political climate of the 2000 aughts. That climate did also offer an opportunity to ask some challenging questions. Is there really no queer love in Mississippi or no history of queer people in Mississippi, no space for love to be expressed and grow? Well, if there is, then who are the pioneers of Southern queer identity? Surely, surely we did not arrive on the map fully formed somewhere around 2001, just like, and there we were or anything. But if we do have a history, then where are the love stories, tragic, happy, whichever, that record the desire that we can now say out loud, even on a stage down the street just a little ways from the state capitol. I hope they're not watching. I would be remiss here not to mention John Marzalek's 2020 book, Coming Out of a Magnolia Closet, Same-Sex Couples in Mississippi. Using interviews with same-sex couples in the state, Marzalek, who by the way has also presented on this stage, documents the legalization of same-sex marriage and its impact, but he also explores the history of homosexuality in Mississippi, including the fact 
that Mississippi has long maintained its 1839 law against sodomy, even after the 2003 Supreme Court case Lawrence v. Texas declared that such laws are unconstitutional. Creekmore's 1948 novel vastly predates the recent advances in LGBTQ plus rights. In fact, it even predates by over 20 years what is considered the watershed moment in LGBTQ plus rights activism and visibility, the Stonewall Riots, which took place in New York City in June of 1969, and which are often cited as the origin moment for the queer activism which with, we, with which we are so familiar today. 1948 is long before that. It is on the front end even of Howard's queer Mississippi history. The 1940s were a time of strict restrictions on depictions of queer identities in print and in films. The Hayes Code was operative in Hollywood. To avoid being labeled obscenity and thus being effectively banned, queer authors prior to the 1950s were mostly stuck writing tragic stories of gay lives that involved drug use, prostitution, the corruption of innocence, etc., etc., if they wanted to include queer identities in their fiction at all. Creekmore's novel is not a happy gay love story, but it also very deliberately avoids stereotypes of prurient homosexuality. The tragedy in the novel stems entirely from context. It is a story of two young men who would love each other if such love had a space to be possible. The two protagonists, Don and Jim, are frankly pretty white bread, pretty vanilla. They are middle class, cisgendered men in their mid-twenties in a small town that is relatively free of the hell and tarnation religion of some southern text. They have friends who all enjoy going to the movies, buying new cars, and sneaking sips of alcohol at parties. Here's where it's worth noting that the novel is set during Prohibition, but was originally conceived as taking place after World War II. In many ways, the progressive attitudes of the characters seem to remain closer to that original setting, even as Creekmore, while he wrote the novel, opted to adjust the time period back a few years to a time a little bit closer to his own life in the, as a 20-year-old in and around Ashton slash Water Valley. Don and Jim are not chased into the closet by a violently repressive society. Frankly, when one of them does admit to a friend that he had a crush on the other, the friend's like, oh, I didn't know. Wow. And that's about that, right? Um, also, there's no itinerant preacher who arrives in town and converts everyone into some old-time religion via some revival. And yet, despite all of that, they are not able to find a place to be together, to relate to each other, to do what another gay writer, E.M. Forster in England, sought in his own fiction, his famous quote, to connect, to only connect. In my first encounter with Creekmore, there I was holding in my hand a book that felt like it connected to something bigger, something historical, something vast, if not always easy to document, queer Mississippi lives. The catch was, of course, what to do with it, since, as books go, copies of it were so vanishingly, vanishingly rare. I'm going to step back for a second and take a sip of my green tea. I'm getting a little parched up here, sorry. But moving on, let's see, yeah. The structuring principle for this talk today is actually based on a quote from another queer writer who's one of my favorite living authors who's wildly praised and everyone knows her books. You can find them in any bookstore. Um, and as I was putting this uh, talk together and thinking about the fact that I'm currently advising a newspaper and invested in journalism, um, this quote came to mind. The author is Ali Smith, a Scottish queer writer. In her 2011 novel, There But For The, one of her characters offers this assessment of the state of contemporary journalism. Quote, he said he could sum up the last six decades of journalism in six words. By the middle of the 20th century, every important reporter put it like this, I was there. Um, nowadays, there I was, end quote. 
In recent years, though, there has been a movement in LGBTQ plus studies away from the purely objective, descriptive approach to reclaiming the legacies of historical queer lives, and instead towards something more personal, such as memoir writing, exemplified by, say, Jim Sha Jen Chaplin's My Autobiography of Carson McCullers, or, to put a more local spin on it, um, this year's book, Casey uh, Parks, The Diary of a Misfit. I believe Casey Parks was here just a couple weeks ago speaking at Millsaps. Some of you might have had a chance to encounter her there. The mental calisthenics required for queer theory do very little to help us recover LGBTQ history as lived experience. Simultaneously, just an objective, detached assessment of an archive can also fail us. Rarely do we find smoking gun evidence, the explicit lost love letters or photos to verify who loved whom or what they might have been up to in private. Still, it is with something like this more detached approach that I took with me to the J.D. Bro no, the L.D. Brodsky Collection at Southeast Missouri State University in 2010, when, on a grant from the University of Mississippi, I went there to visit the extensive archives they have on William Faulkner, who I originally studied, and his biographer, Joseph Blotner. So let's borrow from Smith's commentary for part two of this talk. If I started with, there I was. Let's move into the, I was there. In the archive, researching biographical data on William Faulkner in an effort to connect him to queer people in the worlds of literature and art, or in New Orleans or New York or in Hollywood or anywhere where he might have encountered queer life that was visible and maybe even part of those communities. Creekmore was definitely on my mind. He was just slightly younger than Faulkner. In fact, almost the same age as Faulkner's younger brother, Dean. Creekmore had attended the University of Mississippi in the mid to late 1920s, a time when Faulkner was primarily located in New Orleans, living with his gay roommate, William Spratlin, and hanging out with a decidedly bohemian cast of characters, many of whom were, at minimum, not strictly speaking, straight. But he also came home to Oxford very often in these years, and two of his closest friends, Phil Stone, a local lawyer, Ben Wasson, another lo lawyer in the area, were living in Mississippi. Stone was still in Oxford with some brief periods down in Charleston. Wasson was stationed in Greenville, but made frequent trips to Oxford as well. I thought maybe the paths of any of these men might have crossed anyway, and that maybe Faulkner and Creekmore might have at least some mutual connections somewhere. Notably, I was on a fishing trip, to be blunt about it. I had no idea what, if anything, I'd find. And traditionally, Creekmore already occupies the attention of scholars devoted to another, I don't know, somewhat famous Mississippi writer, Eudora Welty. Um, Creekmore and Welty were, were very good friends throughout their lives. Um, they also were family through the marriage of two of their siblings. Um, let's see, Creekmore loved photography, Creekmore loved gardening, Creekmore wrote books. I could say the exact same sentence and just substitute Welty. Uh, they, they were definitely good friends, and they lived near each other when uh, Creekmore's family moved here to Jackson, over on Pinehurst Street, no less. Until recently, the most extensive biographical information on Creekmore relates to his friendship with Welty. Creekmore grew up in Water Valley, but when he was attending University of Mississippi, his family moved here to Jackson. Welty, two years Creekmore's junior, eventually met him. They both loved literature and gardening, as I said. Through the early 1930s, they did encourage each other's young writing careers. At least according to John Bain, a private collector of Creekmore memorabilia, Welty actually at first considered Creekmore the real author herself just the novice. Bain also claims that Creekmore was the one who suggested to Welty that she submit her work to the literary journal Manuscript in 1936 after he had placed a story with the same journal the year before. Welty's story might could serve as her debut into the literary world with much greatness to follow, and if that is the way in which Welty scholars interpret the start of her career, then Creekmore's there at its inception. By the early 1930s, Creekmore had drafted two novels, neither of which were published, 
So he seems to have steered away from prose for a little while. He finally found success publishing volumes of poetry in the early 1940s when he also served in the Pacific during World War II. His first novel, well, his first published novel, appeared in 1946, the same year as Welty's Delta Wedding, <laughs> originally titled The Fingers of Night and later, when it appeared in paperback with a rather salacious cover, uh, Cotton Country. It tells the story of Tessie and her beau, Clance, who gets Tessie pregnant before they are married. Fearing her religious father, Tessie and Clance um, do get married. They flee their hill country home and move to the Delta to start their life together. But when Tessie's father visits during what should be the final stages of her pregnancy, Tessie flees again, alone into the night, lest he see what she perceives as her sin. A grotesquely constructed figure, Tessie's father has adopted a violent, anti-sex version of religion that equates all sexuality with shame and dirtiness. The details in the novel suggest that Tessie's father likely murdered Tessie's mother when he suspected her of too much sexual independence. Tessie's fling sends her into labor. Later, she kills her baby rather than have her father discover her with it. And here I pause to note that among wealthy scholars, who are wonderful folks, they sometimes wonder why we've, pro why we've chose the welcome to reprint, because they've been wanting to get Fingers of Night back in print for years, so sorry, Welty people, but the welcome's great. Um, set beside Welty's novel, Delta Wedding, Fingers of Night certainly offers, let's say, a contrasting view of traveling into the Delta for a wedding and big family affair. Though, as I'm a trained Faulknerian, I'd also venture that actually, when you look at the details of the novel, it might have influenced the later novel, Faulkner's 1951 Requiem for a Nun, that explores similar themes through the horrifying lens of infanticide. Connections, though, between Welty and Creekmore, they are very well established. I do hope there's more work that people will do on those connections. But then between Creekmore and Faulkner, well. As I sat in that archive up in Missouri, at that point, Really, none had been established at all. That is, none except an overlooked side note in Joseph Blotner's original two-volume biography of Faulkner. So Joseph Blotner, when he was preparing his biography of William Faulkner, interviewed some of Faulkner's fraternity brothers. See, Faulkner had secretly rushed the fraternity SAE when he briefly attended the University of Mississippi in 1919 and 1920. Then he left school when he and several of his fraternity brothers were forced to de-enroll by then Governor Lee Russell, who in a fit of pique at not having been accepted into any fraternities during his own time at Ole Miss, had decided to ban so-called secret societies in universities across the state. To track what really occurred, Blotner interviewed Rufus and Wade Creekmore both of whom appear in a group photo of SAE members alongside William Faulkner and Ben Wasson and Finn, Phil Stone, both of whom also left the university during the same fraternity crisis that led to Faulkner's leaving, all of whom did so under the legal advice of one Hiram Hubert Creekmore Sr., who was coming up every night from Water Valley during the crisis in the evenings to counsel the SAE members on what they should do. Faulkner would later write home in 1921 on a visit from, uh, to New Haven, Connecticut to mention to his mother that he had run into Rufus Creekmore that day who was finishing the law degree he didn't get to finish at the University of Mississippi at Yale. So I was there in the archive, you might say, when I came across the Blotner notes from his interview with Rufus and Wade Creekmore, and I was struck by an epiphany. They had to know each other. They just had to. There's no other way to think through this. Their families were chock full of North Mississippi lawyers. All the men from multiple generations of both the Creekmore and Faulkner families had rushed SAE legally and otherwise through the latter 19th and into the early 20th centuries. Rufus, in particular, was an important socialite and athlete on campus. So what if, just what if, this led Faulkner later to turn his eye to their little brother who wrote poems and stories like he did. As a matter of fact, Faulkner would later turn his eye to that little brother. In 1930, Faulkner appears to have written a letter of introduction on behalf of Creekmore to Faulkner's publisher, Harrison Smith, when Creekmore, 
carrying the manuscript for what would be his first, though ultimately unpublished novel, The Elephant's Trunk, left Mississippi hoping to conquer the world in New York and hoping to find success that never materialized. He was home in Jackson within a few months. At my hotel that night, I was just so excited, I fired off an excited email to my dissertation committee, which included a person whose name also deserves mentioning here, one Dr. Annette Tressler at the University of Mississippi. So the version of the story that I was told involves Annette, a wealthy scholar of, you know, some repute, um, moving to Water Valley when she was first hired by the University of Mississippi. As a wealthy scholar who had also become involved in the Water Valley Main Street Association, she discovered that Water Valley was home to this guy named Hubert Creekmore before he moved to Jackson and later met Eudora Welty. Later, when Jamie Harker moved to Water Valley, Annette filled her in, not only on the local author, but on the fact his second novel, published novel, was a novel about the love between two young men. Then, of course, flash forward a couple years, Jamie told me about it. Then I read it and was intrigued by it. Then I went to an archive in Missouri and found a Faulkner connection. Then I emailed my committee an overexcited email and went back to Oxford, checked out the welcome from our campus library, made a copy of the book, as I, re as I previously explained, because I thought, there's something here. And you know, just in case, just in case. Shortly thereafter, I had the privilege of winning the Francis Bell McCool Fellowship for Faulkner Studies, which led me to be invited, along with both Jamie and Annette, to drinks one April afternoon with Campbell McCool, the sponsor of the fellowship that he had named in honor of his mother. Sipping a delightful glass of red wine, I was asked to talk about my project, at which point I began to worry that Campbell didn't know that I was writing gay Faulkner, just Faulkner. Faulkner or something, but obviously just saying, uh, so yeah, I'm writing on William Faulkner was not going to cut it in a setting with somebody who sponsors a, you know, a fellowship <laughs> uh, for Faulkner studies. So I just decided to dive in, and of course Campbell thought it was a, gr a great idea and fully supported it. So I thought, I'll tell him a little bit more. Maybe he wants to know some of the other people I'm researching. So I mentioned I was looking for other literary connections, and then I said I was interested in a Water Valley writer named Hubert Creekmore. What happened next is my version of the coolest literary story ever. Well, okay, at least the coolest one that I've been involved with, which is, you know, admittedly kind of a small sampling, but let's just roll with it. Campbell didn't need me to tell him who Hubert Creekmore was. He knew the Creekmores, some of whom still lived in North Mississippi in the area. He offered to reach out to the family for me. Suddenly, the interested parties with a stake in this game, that proverbial dog in the hunt, as we'd say down south, all had a chance to come together. Annette had taken an interest as an English professor and a wealthy scholar who moved to Water Valley. She told Jamie, and let me tell you, if there is a mother of Southern queer literary studies, her name is Jamie Harker, just FYI, who told a student of hers in an independent study that student was taking around 2007. That student found a connection in an archive, later won a fellowship, and then met the sponsor for the fellowship who knew the Creekmores. About a year later, at the annual meeting of the Mississippi Philological Association, Wade's son Jimmy and his wife Meredith, along with Mary Alice Welty White and her husband Donnie, sat in on what we think was the first conference panel devoted exclusively to the works of Hubert Creekmore. And Mary Alice, by the way, would be the daughter of Creekmore's sister who married Welty's brother. For me, okay, personally, the curveball in the story was finding a job in Wisconsin. <laughs> it's probably snowing there right now. Uh, the Creekmores, with the help of MDAH and no small amount of enthusiasm from Annette, owner of Beaux-Arts Art Gallery in Water Valley, and Jamie Harker, just before she opened her bookstore, actually worked to place an historic marker in front of Creekmore's childhood home. Of his three published novels, The Welcome is the one listed on the marker. Certainly, scenes in the novel feel as if they are told by someone who might be only a slightly fictionalized version of Hubert Creekmore looking down on the dark street from the upstairs window of that home, wondering about the quiet, lonely lives in small southern towns like Water Valley. No, I'm sorry, I mean Ashton. As I draw towards my conclusion today, I'd actually like to mostly finish up by reading a longer passage from the novel, 
told from the perspective of Don Mason on his first night back in Mississippi after he tried to flee to New York when Jim married a co-ed from university named Doris. See, Don and Jim clearly loved each other, but could never say it to each other. Instead, Jim follows the trajectory he is supposed to and marries Doris. That marriage, that betrayal of the love Don and Jim felt for each other, led to their separation. Don flees to New York, unable to bear small-town rural Mississippi life. Volumes upon volumes of queer histories explore these migration patterns, small-town denizen feeling too different to fit in, leaving for the big city, usually the Big Apple. But Don doesn't thrive there either. Creekmore, who did eventually make New York his home, envisioned the return of a man like that, a man like him, to a small town, the small town from which he came. So in this passage, he is looking through a window on the empty streets below, searching for a place in the world. The night is thick and dark, warm for being summer. Creekmore writes, Then he stood upright and went swiftly to the door and put out the lights. He waited until his sight was adjusted to, re to the reflection of the moonless sky through the dormer windows. From the door, he couldn't see the window frames, but gradually his eyes distinguished furniture. He moved slowly toward the nearest dormer and rounding the corner it cut into the room, faced the pale windows. The sill was about two feet from the floor and he sat down with the deliberation of a man drinking poison and leaned his arms on it and looked out into the night. The treetops at each side of the roof furled up around his view like dark, restless lace, framing the perspective of dim, unpeopled shapes opposite. The lawn stretched flat and unbroken to the black street where two round clip ligistrum bushes guarded the walk. On the pavement at the left, a wriggling model of shadows fell to the branches of a tree crowding around the street light. Nothing had life but these shadows and the reminiscent wind that gave them life. The houses across the way were vacant shells, solidly impenetrable in their heavy obscurity, an occasional column, banister rail, iron fence, or cornice touched pallidly by the distant light. This was the development of the childhood dream vision he had stared into, waiting and wondering, and it had darkened and deadened, and in its barrenness and hunger had dragged him back to stare, it, to stare in its scornful face the rest of his days. And Jim, Jim Furlow, with his wife in their little house, in their bedroom, happily married, settled down into family life. When he thought of their companionship now, it was lighted with frank sentimentality. It seemed only natural that it should be. Perhaps far under Jim's love for Doris, the same sentimental light flooded over his recollections of days spent with him. Jim's presence had been an ordering principle of each day, a focus in which the jumble and drabness of small town life acquired a purpose and a symmetry, a magic instrument by which the commonplace changed to beauty. He was never ashamed of his willful transformation of Jim's qualities into powers of a higher degree. That, too, was as natural as the sentimentality with which he looked back on it. For in his jokes, his laughter, implications in horseplay, Jim betrayed a restrained affection. But before Don could ever speak the words, not with his eyes, but with his mouth, Jim had turned away from him. All around his horizon, the houses he no longer felt close to, the houses that must have already shut him away, lifted their roofs above the trees along the two ridges of Ashton. They secretly guarded their inhabitants and held them silent in their walls and made those mysterious in the night who in the day were trivial. The warm breeze brushed over the town like an ineffectual blessing. In the east, the deep yellow arc of the moon had thrust above the hills. But only he saw it tonight. And only he saw the houses imprisoning the people the people imprisoning each other, and each person imprisoning his own heart in the dark, silent fear of community. 
Sometime in 2007 or in 2010, I think it was reading this passage from about 50 pages into the novel when I realized, for myself at least, I was holding something truly magnificent. And if one role for English professors is to tell high school teachers what to teach, here's a little primer. Don is describing the loneliness and isolation of being queer in a small Mississippi town. The night creates a heightened backdrop for his feelings upon returning, unable to find a better life in a big city, and wondering, what now? It is a beautiful and evocative passage. It is such a moving passage, I think, because it comments on what is hidden in shadows and darkness, but is, nonetheless, very real, discernible as a shape in history, the contours of historical queer Mississippi life. The other role of English professors is to preserve lost and forgotten text. So to put it mildly, it feels so very good to tell you that I transcribed that passage not from my photocopied edition of The Welcome, but from the actual book reissued now for others to read and to consider about this place that so many of us, even those of us who technically live in Wisconsin and have gone to the South, still very much consider our home. So I was there in the archive. And now here we are, talking about Hubert Creekmore's novel. Maybe now, after all these years from its original publication, we've finally started to catch up with him in time. So yeah, here we are. See what I just did there? There I was. I was there. Here we are on a Wednesday in March, springtime in Mississippi. As someone who has absconded northward to the frozen tundras of Wisconsin, please believe me when I tell you that I can think of few things more beautiful than a spring day in Mississippi. And here we are. But frankly, it is not a good time to be a queer person in Mississippi. In preparing this talk today, I've thought a lot about the present political landscape. Sadly, Mississippi has joined many other states, certainly not only southern states, in ramping up attacks on queer people, especially queer children. Arguments that imply we don't belong here are severely undercut by evidence that we've been here all along. I'm just saying, I was there. There I was. We are here. Here we are. The, reissue of, the reissuing of a 1948 lost gay novel by a mostly forgotten Mississippi novelist does not solve the problems faced by queer communities today, but it does serve as a timely reminder that below the explosive political rhetoric Stories exist, histories can emerge, communities can be discovered. Queer pioneers can, finally, get much deserved attention. Hopefully across this next river, we'll all finally come out clean together on the other side. Now, as I hope there's some time left for some questions, I appreciate you all being here today, in person and online, and I'll close with a statement, with a sentiment I expressed earlier, and maybe all of you can pick up the book and hopefully agree. You know, Hubert, all things being equal, you wrote one hell of a good book. Thank you. If anyone has a question, we can bring the mic to you and you can ask it. All right. <laughs> you cannot go questionless. Was the photo at Windsor taken at the same time Eudora took the photo where sh her shadow is shown? I knew I was going to start with a question <laughs> about Welty. Um, I came to Creekmore as a Faulkner scholar, and I'm not as well read on Welty or the history with Welty. Um, beyond what Suzanne Mars has written in her biography, which makes abundant references to Creekmore. So um, Chris had even said, hey, talk about Welty a little bit. Obviously, you have to. It's Creekmore and Welty. These, these people are very interrelated, and that needs to be established and praised. Uh, but I'm like in Wisconsin with Suzanne Mars' biography and like no other resources to do some like searching on this, which is my long way of saying, I don't know. <laughs> but, but I'd like to find out. <laughs> Hang on a second, let me let you ask that with the mic so that the folks watching the video can hear it. What's your take on Quick Creekmore's poetry? I, so Creekmore as a poet um, wrote poetry across his life. And as such, I'm, I'm going to go for sort of a safe scholarly answer to say it changes a lot. 
At times he wrote poetry that feels very much um, grounded in its moment. Uh, it's from a, a version of poetry, the way in which rhythm and rhyme and, and meter are used. That is not something I love. That's a little bit too romanticized. Um, other times he wrote shockingly modernist poetry that really played with form. Long and the short of it, I think that it would behoove people to revisit his poetry. I can make the comment as a Faulkner scholar, Faulkner began by publishing poetry. And it is an interesting side note in studies of Faulkner that he wrote poetry. And that may be all you need to know. I would not recommend reading it. <laughs> With Creekmore, I'm not sure you can fully understand him as a writer until you look at his poetry. He began as a poet in many ways. He played around with prose. He didn't write a novel until after he graduated college. Um, had no success as a prose writer. But actually, I mean, I, I did short change to it in the talk today. In my intro to the book, I give at least the, the, the list of the publications. Beginning in the 1940s, he had multiple volumes of poetry. He also was a translator. Um, you can find, actually, it's a little bit easier to find books where Creekmore is listed as a translator or editor. Uh, he published translations of poems from Latin. Um, he published some point where he wrote some poetry. I don't know if it ended up being published in Spanish and other Romance languages. Um, he had a deep love for classical literature, uh, all of which, by the way, he, he was a great poet, and I hope more attention is paid to his poetry. He's a fascinating novelist and brilliant in his way. At the end of his life, his last book was neither a book of poetry nor a book of, of, uh, of prose as a novel. He wrote a gardening book called The Daffodils Are Dangerous. And it both tells you all you need to know about growing certain flowers and plants here in Mississippi while simultaneously telling you their full history through like, you know, Ovid's Metamorphoses uh, or, or Bullfinch's Mythology. And it's an absolutely delightful book that combines so much of his, his talent and his loves. Gardening, writing, making the allusions to classical text. Um, and again, w worth your time if, you, if any of you need a good gardening book in your life. You know, so. We have a question from the live stream. Um, our friend Monica Miller, who spoke just a few weeks ago with her book, Tacky South, asks, what's been the most surprising or satisfying part of this project for you? Okay, it's, as a scholar, it's, it's always a big deal to get to like find a lost text and republish it. Um, and that's not unheard of. It happens quite a bit. But you always worry that you'll find a book that you just think is the dandiest thing that's ever been written. And you'll get people to agree to publish it. And then there'll sort of be a collective, oh, <laughs> well, that's nice. Um, so far, the response, when people hear about this book, even long before we were able to publish it, uh, to get it reissued with the press, and as it's been reissued, has been a real, like, deep interest and in, like we need to be talking about this and obviously it's incredibly gratifying to 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 feel that you know some of us and definitely not just me had spotted that when we picked this text up and i i do as as much as it is such a privilege to be the one who has the honor to stand here today it does do um a disservice to so many other people who had spent a great deal of time trying to find any of his works back into print. Some of which are, I mean, you can find a copy of Fingers of Night um, for a pretty decent price, I think under 20 bucks. Uh, if you look around at used bookshops, um, it's just not as rare. The Welcome really is a very, very rare text. And that's always led to questions. It's like, why? Well, uh, John Bain argues um, that probably because it's such a collector's item and it only went through one printing. There is a a pretty decent amount of animosity that rises to the surface of Creekmore's writings in letters and stuff to his publishers about the welcome, where my read on it is he recognized he was doing something very important. And at the time, I don't think he was getting the response that he de deserved and wanted. Again, the New York Times review that was, there was like, you know, Faulkner's big blurb, and then way at the back there's this paragraph. Oh, there's a Southern novel. It's, you know, Southern and weird, or something like that. And he really took that on the chin. He didn't appreciate that sort of dismissal of his work. Um, and I think it did a lot of sort of damage to him as a writer, feeling like he has this really amazing thing that just sort of goes nowhere. Um, 
and as someone who's, who encountered it uh, and met others who were like, no, you, you need to be reading this. It is incredibly gratifying to see it come to fruition as a reissue and to, and to see other people responding to it with the same kind of like zeal, with the same kind of yes, thank you, this. And again, I get have my name on the cover, but there are so many people who deserve the credit for that. Any other questions? I have one, actually. Um, so Creekmore was a native Water Valleyan, God bless him. Uh, but he spent his later years, yeah, actually, actually, <laughs> spent his later years in Jackson and New York City. Would you talk to us a little bit about those years? Why did he stay in Jackson some? Why was he in New York some? What, what were those years like for him, both personally and professionally? I'm going to answer that by talking a bit about the, the challenge of reconstructing his biography. Um, there's a, uh, a woman up at, Mississippi, at the University of Mississippi named uh, Mary Knight who has actually done a short film on Creekmore in which she's mostly uh, documenting Water Valley and looking at some, how some of his texts are clearly inspired by it. It's a beautiful film. You can uh, find it, I think, on Vimeo. Uh, Mary's very happy, happy to share it. She's doing a lot of biographical work right now and uh, has, I think, been in touch with the family about <laughs> something more extensive biographically. Beyond chats with her, the only source of biographical information has largely been a handful of like, encyclopedia entries on a list of Southern authors or related to Welty. As such, it's difficult to reconstruct a precise timeline. We know he was at the University of Mississippi and graduated in 27. Somewhere between 26 and 29 is when his family moves here to Jackson. He obviously is spending time here but he also maintains connections with a lot of uh, literary folks in Oxford. In 1930, I know he leaves for New York. He's there for a few months, but then by late 1930, he's back in Jackson, I think, more or less, quote unquote, full time. But he's always looking for opportunities. He ends up going to a, like, getting a degree out in Colorado. He, I think, got a degree from Yale. Um, when he works in Washington, D.C. for a while, but then he also finds himself here in Jackson working for, like, I think the highway department or something like that. Um, always sort of making ends meet while he's working on his, uh, his writing. And, and obviously, he's here through the 30s, becoming very good friends with Dora Welty. In the 40s, he, uh, he serves in World War II. He's out in the Pacific Theater. Um, somewhere around there, he seems to have shifted towards New York. He, he did a stint at Yaddo, the writer's uh, retreat. He taught for a semester at the University of Iowa in their creative writing program. And I've tried to reach out. That This is mercifully when Creekmore makes it to my neck of the woods. That's a two-hour drive from where I live. I've been trying to figure out the right approach to see if there's any kind of records of his time there teaching creative writing classes. Um, just before he died, and I will thank so much uh, Jimmy and Wade, his nephews, for this, um, he wrote a letter home to his mother about being in New York, but looking forward to traveling to Europe. Um, and in that letter, you sort of get the sense that New York may be where he's based, the publishing world, but it's not necessarily a place that he has to be forever. Um, there's up at the University of Mississippi, I think it's in, it's not in Isherwood's papers, it's, no, it is in Creekmore's papers. He has some letters from the 40s where he's traveling to California and meeting Christopher Isherwood and other uh, queer writers and writing home about it. He seems very much a kind of a, a global kind of figure. Um, I don't know, and I, I would not want to state too, too strongly whether that means he just couldn't find home. But the fact that in The Welcome he's writing about someone who goes to New York and doesn't make it and finds himself back home, even if resentful, even if not loving that he's home, I think suggests sort of something of a rootlessness that's worth exploring more in his biography. Well, we have come to the top of another hour. Um, I hope that you all will take a look at the Freedom Seder and some of the other events that we have coming up. Uh, come back next week for History is Lunch, and then uh, next week, Susanna Curry talking about her book, The Preventorium, and then the next week will actually be Annette Trefser with her book. How about that? She did not pay me. To I'm, not saying, I'm not saying you have to have a Water Valley connection to do History's Lunch, but it really does help. We have copies of the welcome for sale over here. Thank you all for being here. Help me thank Pip Gordon for this fantastic program.